Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick Gumowitz, the Engelson Family Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, Sally Menard and Norton Garfinkel, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. Since its creation 60 years ago, the show has prized civility as its basic operating principle. If you think about the root of that word, its goal is the perpetuation of civilization. One President Kennedy articulated in 1963 that we all inhabit this small planet, we all breathe the same air, we all cherish our children's future, and we're all mortal. Our guest today extends that royal we to the kingdom of animals and plants, author of The Annihilation of Nature, Human Extinction of Birds and Mammals, Mexican conservationist Gerardo Ceballos joins me to discuss his landmark study of accelerated human-induced species loss. His stunning finding? We're entering the sixth great extinction of humanity. Wow. A scholar at Stanford University and the University of Mexico's Institute of Ecology, Ceballos is credited with spearheading the first Endangered Species Act of Mexico. Humanity has unleashed a massive and escalating assault on all living things, Ceballos writes, potentially the worst ecological crisis since the asteroid hit that killed the dinosaurs. Welcome, Gerardo. Thank you very, very much to be here. It's a pleasure to have you here, especially because we recently had the president of your country, Ernesto Zedillo, on the show as well. Why are we oblivious to this gloom and doom scenario, or at least seemingly oblivious to it? Well, it seems to me that uh, humans, we are uh, evolved and understanding things that happen in very immediate to ourselves. And the problems with the plants and animals that are becoming extinct is that many of them are living in remote areas far away from our everyday uh, living. So that's one of the problems. Uh, the, the, there is another problem that I think is even uh, worse than that. There has been a lot of media paid by big corporations and big uh, uh, interest groups to deny the problem. And uh, we as scientists have a really important responsibility, on the one hand, not to exaggerate what the data is here, but on the other hand, to be extremely honest to say what the data is telling us. And what it's telling us right now is that we are really losing so many plants, so many animals so fast that it is similar to the five previous extinctions on the uh, history of life on Earth. Why don't you contextualize that? You're alluding to subtly climate change as a threat that looms large here, but how do you contextualize the present problem. Let, let's let's rem uh, remember that life on Earth has been for three, uh, 3.5 billion years there has been life on Earth. And during that time, there have been five massive uh, episodes of extinction. We scientists call mass extinction. There have been five that we know. And those five extinctions were, uh, were caused all by natural causes. For instance, a big uh, meteorite, the changes in the gases of the atmosphere, the changes on the uh, uh, sea levels, and so on. So these massive Im important changes on the in nature has uh, caused the extinctions of many plants and animals. And the second uh, characteristics of those mass extinctions that were relatively rapid in the uh, geological time, taking a few thousand or uh, hundreds, even millions of years. Uh, to happen. And finally, they impact many, many uh, groups of animals and plants. In this particular case, we say that we're entering the sixth extinction because basically this uh, has the same characteristics. It's affecting many plants, many animals, especially many animals. It's happened 
really fast and it's caused in this particular by humans, by your activities. A main difference from the past extinction is that this is caused by humans and that's the bad news, that's the bad news, but also this could be the good news because if we are causing them, we also can uh, stop it, revert the problem. You can take a proactive role. It's incredibly important that we understand that we can uh, change uh, th this problem. Like in global warming, the, you know, there is like a two opposing views. Like uh, we have 10,000 scientists saying, of 9,993 uh, saying that this is happening and this is caused by humans. And the rest saying it's not caused by humans. Let me tell you what is good news. If it is caused by human, it means that it can be solved. That we humans can do something to change it. We can understand what is a, a, a causing it, and then we can do then something to uh, stop it, to change it. And this is exactly the same with the extinction of, of animals. We know what is causing it, we know what our activities are doing with them, and therefore we know what can be some of the solutions. And the solutions are important to understand because these are ways we have to change our activities and uh, to save those species. We always want to discuss solutions here on The Open Mind. In fact, it's really our imperative because that's driving the discourse towards positive outcomes. I do want to cite your, your study here. You say that your estimates reveal an exceptionally rapid loss of biodiversity over the last few centuries. You write, averting a dramatic decay of biodiversity and the subsequent loss of ecosystem services is still possible, as you just said, mm -hmm. through intensified conservation efforts. But that window is rapidly closing. So, the basic equation of humanity is we breathe this air thanks to the forest. That's exactly right. I mean, when we say scientists, we have coined this term uh, environmental services. And those services are all the benefits that we get from free for the uh, well function of the uh, plants and animals, of the ecosystems. <coughs> the combination of the gases of the atmosphere, the quality and quantity of water, the fertilization of all the soils on Earth, all of these are consequences of the wild plants and animals, how do they work? Every time we take an animal and a plant, every time one of these populations become extinct or a species become extinct, it's like if we are taking a, a brick on this wall and people say, well, if you take one brick, nothing really happened and we expect that the wall won't collapse, but it starts to work, work less uh, properly, more uh, noise, uh, dust, whatever. So we're taking too many of those bricks from the wall. And what is worth saying here is there are so many that eventually, sooner, very soon, we, we will take some of them and the whole thing will collapse. In other words, what we're saying there is that our study, what it shows, that in the last 100 years, the species of vertebrates, mammals, birds, amphibians, and reptiles that were lost because of human activities that become extinct, uh, if you use the data that we know what happened in the last two million years, and we call the background extinction with species that become extinct during normal times, those species that were lost in 100 years would have taken between 1,000 to 10,000 years to be lost during normal times. That's the, uh, how fast this is going. And these are animals that we know uh, what is happening because they are big animals, uh, mammals, birds, very conspicuous. But we also have now information that this is happening also to many of the smaller creatures on Earth and many of the plants. So basically what we're doing, we're eroding the capabilities of life to provide the uh, conditions for uh, life as a whole and for human life. Uh, as in particular, and this is very important to emphasize that the conditions of life on Earth depends on all those plants and animals that we are destroying. And that's what it's become like a really, really a non-brainer, a nonsense to do, you know. I think you point out, importantly, that we are in effect desensitized to the plight of animals. They are part of this great synergy of this universe. They exist because we exist there is a coexistence, a cohabitation. Do you believe that that resonates, that people in this age of Google and instant gratification recognize that there is life beyond Homo sapiens? Well, you know, let me tell you that, that my experience has been in Mexico and elsewhere, that people, usually we uh, ignore the issues, but once we present the information in an in a accessible way, and we're talking about politicians, the uh, 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 
the uh, private uh, industry, they are talking about uh, peasants, we are talking about just uh, school teachers and so on. What well, my experience has been that they, most of them, I, I mean most, 99% of the people are really interested on these issues and are really concerned. Once they know, they really uh, will interact. I remember many years ago working in Mexico uh, when we uh, managed to get the first Endangered Species Act. Uh, uh, you were pivotal in uh, securing that. And you know why? I was one day talking to the uh, head of the uh, wildlife department. She was a mathematician. And I was telling her how difficult it was not to have something to protect the Endangered Species Act in Mexico and why we were so behind the rest of the world especially the U.S. with the Endangered Species Act here. Right. And I told her it's impossible to do something in Mexico with this polit political situation. And uh, she said, Gerardo, you're wrong. Why? And I explained to her what was important, and she spearheaded that. We gave them the data. We worked with her. And six or eight months afterward, the president of Mexico was decreeing the Endangered Species Act of Mexico. Different to the one here that you put one species at a time and you have to, to evaluate all of them. We put, from the beginning, 2,500 species who were endangered in Mexico at that time. And that has become one of the most important policy uh, 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 laws that we have to protect the species and the environment. And it was because of that, because we, I talked to somebody that was sensitive enough and understood the wealth of the problem. She has a very good contact with the president, go and talk to him, he understood, and then we have it, something that was been incredibly important for the country. So I think... But there I, was a climate then that enabled reform that m might be a contrast to today's politics, both in Mexico and in the United States. I, I can't help but ask, is that law still intact? The law is still intact, and uh, let me tell because you... Because ours is not. Exactly. No, no. In Mexico, it's actually... We, ha we are improving it. This year, we are uh, putting new new uh, uh, factors into the law that will help us to enforce it even stronger. Where How, basically, what, what factors? Where, where basically the law is still lacks, is somehow there is like, like a, a difference between what the law says and what are the, the penalties for people who break that law. Mm -hmm. So this year we're working with the Senate in Mexico to make this very smooth. So if you break the law, if you break the Endangered Species Act, the uh, uh, penalties both in jail or both in money, will be very straightforward to follow. So in other words, a judge who is uh, handling a problem of somebody uh, trafficking, let's say, with jaguar bones or jaguar spells in Mexico, will be very easy for him to, to know what to do and to put the proper penalties for that group of that person. This is one thing. The other thing that is uh, right now, let me tell you that in Mexico, Mexico has been one I think the first developing country who has a, a pledge voluntarily to reduce most of his uh, emissions to zero, I mean, to, to be balanced up in the next uh, uh, until 2020. And finally, in the country, we have uh, convinced the government this year to create another 8 million hectares of protected areas, that is probably 20 something million hectares, uh, acres for protecting jaguars and the biodiversity associated to that. So in Mexico, we have still been able to uh, avoid this polarization that is happening in this country to try to see, okay, this is in the benefit for everybody to try to have better water, better quality of water, more grasslands, more uh, forests. I mean, the only way to alleviate the big, big problem of the drugs and the violence in Mexico, I think, will be creating jobs associated to uh, conservation in rural areas of the country. If the government provides that, we will be able to start to uh, reducing some of the big violent uh, problems that are happening in the, in the, in the country because of the lack of, of, of jobs. And this can be a link to the environment. So in other words, there has been, um, I, I, I really have seen the U.S. used to be very important for Mexico other countries to, as, a, as a guide uh, as a leader on those issues. And unfortunately, this has been uh, broken. It's no longer that case. But fortunately for Mexico, there are still uh, many people who value this uh, thinking. And especially, what is value in Mexico is that uh, uh, we're using 
the best scientific data to guide us on these issues. What I'm saying is uh, the data and the scientific data is what should be like the basic a step in stone to understand how do we relate these two economical, the political, to the social issues, not the other way around. There is a, a consensus and there is now a moral underpinning to the movement that you describe. Before we touch on solutions, I know you want to expound on that, it's, it's important to understand that it's not, there's not just an argument against the science. Once you concede that there is a universal scientific truth, that we've established around this table, you ask yourself, well, let's say it's only true to half a degree. Mm -hmm. Then can't we adapt? Basically, what we're proposing, for instance, and, and the idea uh, uh, of those uh, papers and, and books that we're publishing and all this tr uh, uh, trying to modify the laws and to make them more uh, uh, properly set for these times are basically this is the adaptation that we have to do. The adaptation means that we have to understand that the weather is changing. And if we, if we adapt, it means that we will have to have better laws or different laws. So how we, do we uh, uh, populate areas that may become flooded because of- uh, Drought stricken. Uh, and in other words, the adaptation doesn't mean inaction. The adaptation means to understand what are the threats you know, the real threats, the most uh, certain threats based on the uh, better data, and based on that, to start to modify what we can do so we can uh, really try, we can try to uh, uh, survive in the next uh, coming uh, decades. What I really worries me is not only of my study, the studies on geomorphology, on climate, on uh, uh, geology, soils, everything shows that the window of opportunity is really, really small. Most of the people, most of the scientists who really are being very careful but are based these predictions on the best data available, most of them, most of us think that there is no, there is no more than two, three decades in order to avoid a big, big, a massive collapse of civilization. So what is a realistic path to modification of behavior? I think what is ha happening, for instance, I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly uh, uh, happy to have seen, for instance, the Pope, Francis Pope in the Laudato Si, talking about this problem. If you have seen the Laudato Si, it's an incredibly well articulated document. The saying, encyclical. The encyclical, yes, saying that what are some of the problems? Global warming, the inequities and in distribution of wealth, and uh, uh, extinction of species, and so on. The second is like, a, a, the Paris talks, for the first time since 1992, that was the first one, all the nations on earth have agreed that the global warming, that those problems are real, are a threat, and they have to act. In the last few years, we have seen that President Obama and the Chinese uh, uh, president and other important, like the UN, important, important actors are really saying that this is a problem and we have to act. So in other words, I think... But let's get down to brass tacks here in terms of specific behaviors, because you were saying to me off camera that the motivation behind this idea, well, we can adapt no matter what the climate is, in part is a gesture of big commerce. We don't want to worry about our, our yes, bottom right. line right yeah, now. Right. This is cost because of the uh, size of the human enterprise. We need to find out, we need to stop to, to, to download this population growth. We need to uh, start to use less uh, uh, fossil fuels and more uh, green energies. At, I, I, I usually say this at different levels. At the household level, we as uh, individuals, what we can do? Well, we can uh, uh, use, uh, be more efficient in using uh, the stuff like clothes and the food that we choose and so on, or where consumption patterns can really benefit. For instance, if you go to your wardrobe, we don't need 20, 50 uh, trousers and, and, and pants and suits and, you know, we can, uh, or, or shoes. We can be more careful on these kind of things. We can also be more careful on the one, especially the people, the affluent people like us, that we can have, uh, we can choose what to buy. For instance, not buying products from endangered species. We have to be incredibly careful on not buying any product 
that involve endangered species. We can be careful of not buying products who use palm oil coming from plantations that are non-sustainable and are destroying the last forest in Borneo or Sumatra or Indonesia. So uh, these kind of things are incredibly important. First of all, to be aware of that. We need to find out, we need to understand that using uh, 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 cars and using other, we can reduce that. If we can, for instance, go commute to work and have four people or five people in the car instead of uh, through, that's very important. Uh, this is the, the like everyday thing. The other actions that I think are, are, I call them the radical actions. Radical action. We have to push a stronger our government to take a stronger measures towards what really can change the whole scenario. In the case of China, for instance, China was the leading is the leading country driving to extinction many species because of the huge appetite it has for products like ivory. Well, there was this Chinese woman going to Africa like two years ago, visit some of this area. Obviously, she's very affluent, this very have important position there. And, and uh, she was horrified to see what China is doing, the traffic of uh, ivory in China is doing to the, 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 the uh, elephants. The elephants, if we don't do something really, really fast, we may not have wild elephant in the year 2025. Just imagine. And tell us why that's important beyond the fact that you yourself are an advocate of wildlife. Okay. Why, why, is, why is it important? Uh, okay, well, just before, uh, so, so she went back to China and she started a campaign and now the government is imposing a ban on ivory. Well, let me tell you why it is important because what we have learned, and this is what it, uh, uh, that many of these species, particularly for instance, the elephants. The elephants are incredibly important to maintain the conditions of the savanna forest dynamics in Africa. But studies have shown, for instance, that when you lose the uh, elephants, you know, you lose the elephants, then there is more growth of these plants, of the herbs and so on. There is an increased number of rodents. And those rodents happen to be prone to several really nasty diseases that affect humans. So losing the elephant promotes the uh, uh, hemorrhagic uh, diseases like uh, similar to hantavirus or to Ebola in those areas. On, on and we should take note of avian influenza when we think of the illnesses. Uh, that, that's exactly right. For instance, Lyme disease in the U.S. In the U.S., all the big predators uh, like uh, wolf or the uh, mountain lions were exterminated in the eastern U.S. Now the populations of white deer went up, up to 50 million of white deer the white deer and uh, uh, are prone to the sticks who transmit Lyme disease. And Lyme disease is now a really, really serious uh, uh, health problem in the U.S. So this, all of this is linked. It's really the more we learn, the more we learn, the more we understand that losing one of these key components of the, uh, is a causing problem. The other thing I like to mention is uh, uh, many of these, like, like, like uh, elephants or many other animals, are essential. For instance, the pollinators are essential to maintain uh, uh, the food that we get. Right now, there is a crisis of pollinators. We're losing the bees, we're losing the hummingbird, we're losing the bats. If this continues, there could be a huge shortages of food for humanity related to bees. Just to give you an idea, in, in, in Costa Rica, there are places, there's a really nice study where they have uh, coffee plantations away from forests and coffee plantations very close to forests, natural forests. The ones who are close to natural forests have a, has a higher uh, yield of 30 to 40% higher than in the areas with no forest because the pollinators, the bees from the forest come, pollinate the crops and so on. So we are learning, we have all the science and technology to understand how can we do a much better job. The only thing we have to do is to understand that there's a problem and that their solutions require just changes in our attitudes, that's all. When you, th that's all, right? <laughs> when, you, when, you think of, when you think of the idea of extinction, to go back to the beginning prompt, right? Yeah. Civilization, we wanna be civil certainly for the sake of being civil. We care about our brothers and sisters and we want to extend that to the kingdom of life beyond that transcends humanity. So, you know, when you think of, when you think of extinction, I, I wonder 
in light of the five extinctions that we've experienced and, and, and all the phenomena that you describe today, what most resonates for you? This idea that if we don't act, we could become extinct. Well, there are... What, what in your gut? What, how do you respond are, to that word? Yeah, there are a couple of things. One is, let me tell you that even in the worst of the scenarios, unless there is a nuclear war or something else, life on Earth will continue. We are just making like a big dent, 15 million year big dent, but life will continue. Here, the point is, will life continue with humans on Earth? So this is critical. This is and, critical and to, to understand. Do you we, think it will? Well, um, I think we will. I think if we manage to uh, uh, gain some time in the next three or four decades, we will then have enough changes, enough technology, enough understanding, so we will, con we will be able to continue this for the, 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 the next uh, centuries. But the, 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 the coming two, three decades are the critical ones. I think these are the most important times for humanity since our beginning. So, on the most personal, on the more personal thing, uh, uh, it really makes me incredibly sad to lose all the, I mean, a species like that. Because, because uh, uh, for three reasons. One, it is, uh, those, those have been our companions in the universe. This is a very cold, uh, 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 empty, dark universe. And in this universe, our companions have been those plants and animals. Paradoxically, paradoxically, their survival depends on us but our survival depends on their survival. And uh, I read a book when I was 11 years old. It's called The Scheme of Curlew. And then in that particular book, say something like that. It talks about those uh, Scheme of Curlew doing a, a, a flight from uh, Patagonia in Argentina to the Arctic. And he say that they fly. At the end, he say something like, but uh, uh, they fly alone. Lots of their uh, vanishing species, they find this world. Gerardo, we have to remember from where we originated, physically, literally, right? Exactly. I mean, we are part of nature. I mean, we live in cities, we live, most of us live in cities, but it doesn't mean that we are not still part of nature. Thank you, Gerardo Ceballos, for joining me today on The Open Mind. Thank you. Thank you very much for this great opportunity. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash open mind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick Gumowitz, the Engelson Family Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, Sally Menard and Norton Garfinkel, with special thanks to the Schumann Media Center for additional support, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.